Okay, so thank you very much for the invitation. It's a big pleasure for me to give talk here. So certainly I would like to more to give it personally, but anyway, that is what we have right now. So I'm going to talk about uh, random band matrices. So unfortunately, because of time difference, I wasn't able to hear the previous talk, but as far as I understand from abstract and my general notion, uh, it also was about how some kind of phase transition and stuff like that. So let me start with some general introduction, but so probably it will repeat a bit of previous talk, but let me just uh, uh, specify some notions. So uh, when we speak about any kind of random systems, uh, one of the typical questions that we ask is what is called uh, uh, localization lens. So that is a typical lens scale. If you speak about random matrices, that is a typical lens scale of eigenvector of matrices. So in classical random matrix theory, typically we have the uh, delocalized regime, which means that all elements of this eigenvector are more or less of the same size. So the vector has more or less same coordinates. Uh, and uh, physically that corresponds to the diffusion and uh, a weak disorder, certainly. And uh, from the random matrix point of view, that corresponds to the classical random matrix behavior. So if you speak about uh, unitary matrix, it is Gaussian behavior like eigenvectors for Gaussian unitary ensemble or Gaussian orthogonal ensemble, or if you have symplectic case, Gaussian symplectic ensemble, but we are not going to talk about symplectic case today, so I will omit it constantly. Another thing which is more uh, less frequent for uh, classical random matrices, but more frequent for random operators is localization. When you, the weight, so if your eigenvector is normalized, the weight is concentrated on some small number of sites, small comparable to the matrix sites. That physically corresponds to the strong deodorant insulator. And if you speak about the local statistic of eigenvalues, then instead of standard GUE statistic, you will get the Poisson statistics. So that is kind of physical point of view. If you speak about random matrix point of view, that most m there is a question that closely related to this and probably looks a bit more classical for random matrix theory. The question is about behavior of uh, uh, local eigenvalue statistic and in particular about the correlation function. So we define the standard correlation function for k eigenvalues and there is a well-known Wigner Dyson meta, there is many names that you can say about this conjecture, uh, universality conjecture that tells you that limiting behavior of this eigenvector in the bulk of the spectrum will depend only on the symmetry type of the matrix and does not depend on distribution of the matrix and on dependence independence of elements. So more or less that means that, for example, if you take any kind of Hermitian random matrix, when I say any, that certainly um, and a big overestimate, but generally you have to think about most part of Hermitian random matrices. If they are in the localized regime, so the eigenvectors are full, then if you take you take the limit in density, take the point in the bulk of the spectrum, and take one over n neighborhood of this point, which means that you so in the if you take the spectrum and take interval of one over n, then this interval will take only finite number of eigenvalues. So if you consider your correlation function on such intervals, then the limit will be as the same as was obtained for uh, Gaussian unitary ensemble, and it will be determinant of the sign kernel, whatever Hermitian matrix you take. So there are some comments. I don't know how uh, the, the comment is in French, probably it's an answer to someone asking a private question, I suppose. Uh, although, otherwise, the people can, uh, can add that. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it will be better, yes, uh, if it will be just uh, uh, said and loud, because it's a little bit hard for me to follow these questions. 
Okay, so uh, that is what we get for Hermitian case. If you have orthogonal case, you can consider the same limit. The answer will be different from the Hermitian case. It will be a bit more complicated kernel, but anyway, it still will be the same for all kind of orthogonal cases, orthogonal matrices. So, uh, as I told in the random matrix theory, we typically have this kind of statistic, and uh, it was a uh, this conjecture was formulated in the late 60s, and it was a big uh, progress in this uh, question about 10 years ago uh, after the work of Erdos, Yao, and Chao and Wu. And now, for almost all classical ensembles, we already know that indeed we have delocalization in this Gaussian unitary or uh, Gaussian orthogonal local spectral statistics. So that includes Wigner matrices, classical beta ensembles with beta equal one and two, sample coherence matrices, uh, uh, sparse matrices, a regular deregular graph, and many other things. So it's not full, for example, for deregular graph, it's not for all D, so you still need, uh, there are still some problems that is not uh, close here, but it was a really big progress in that uh, question in the last 10 years. So, um, from other side, from the side of a random operator, there is another famous model. This is random Schrodinger operator or Anderson model, whatever you prefer to name it. Uh, that is, uh, uh, you have a deterministic Laplacian plus random diagonal potential. So all, all randomness are on the diagonal. Here, lambda is a length of disorder that you have. And uh, so for D equal one, you see how this matrix looks like. And it is well known from 80s, from the work of uh, Froelich Spencer and then Eisman Malchanov that this model has localization and Poisson lo local spectral statistic in dimension one. So you see that it's somehow two points uh, of the spectrum. And the model that we want to consider is somehow interpolate between oops, these two. Uh, so, uh, what is random bed matrices? It is, uh, we will start with the Hermitian case and mainly we'll, call, uh, we'll talk about the Hermitian case. So, it is uh, uh, Hermitian n times n matrix and uh, all elements are independent up to the symmetry, but now the covariance of each element, so for Wigner matrices it is just stable, it's one over n for all elements, now it will depend on the distance from the main diagonal and typically it is just zero if distance from the diagonal is bigger than w or sometimes instead of zero it is just has some decays, polynomial decay or exponential decay or some other decay. But anyway, it is uh, small after distance from the diagonal becomes big. So if we speak about the picture, so in dimensional one, again, it, you can define it in any dimensional, but for dimensional one, the picture looks like that. You have a the strip of side 2w with non-zero elements, and you have zero or small decay covariance for other elements. So you see that for, if you have just finite number of diagonal, it is similar to random Schrodinger. Um, so certainly not uh, completely similar because you don't have deterministic Laplacian, but still it is look like, uh, more like random Schrodinger. If W, which is the length, so once again, the length of the strip is 2W, so uh, this W is called the band width, and if W is equal to N, you have a usual Wigner matrices, it's a full matrix full of elements. So that is how this matrix looks like. So uh, you see that indeed it is somehow should be interpolated model between these two different type of behavior. And that is exactly what physicists predicted. And uh, there is a, a long-standing again physical kind of prediction. So for D equal one, it was 
predicted by Fyodorov and Mierlin in early 90s, that the behavior view change, local behavior of eigenvalue view change if you change W. So first of all, I probably have to say that if only W goes to infinity together with size of the matrix, then the uh, spectrum will be the density view be a usual semicircle. So it doesn't matter how W grows, it grows if it only grows together with N, you have a usual semicircle. The, the global Sorry, I, I wasn't able to get this. Me neither. I, I don't know who was uh, speaking. I don't see anyone with an open mic in the participant list, so so it, it looks like a bug. I hope it will okay. not happen again. Okay. So. Uh, so once again, if only W goes to infinity, you have density view be the same as for the full matrix, Wigner matrix. So, uh, but the local behavior view change depending on growth of W and the conjecture that it is, it will be as for the Wigner matrices and if W bigger than square root of N and it will be like Schrodinger, so localized and Poisson statistic if W is smaller than square root of N. So for higher dimensions, for d equal to, the conjecture is going to happen at square root of log n. And for d bigger or equal than three, it is expected that if w is bigger than some constant, we have delocalization. The interesting thing is that this conjecture are closely related to co existing conjecture for Anderson model. So if you just put this lambda that we have here oops where it was yeah this lambda of order one over w then the conjecture for this conjecture can be translated directly to the conjecture for uh, a random anderson uh, a random Schrodinger operator and for d equal one it is not conjecture it's the theorem but for other for d equal two or d equal three that one of the big problems that is staying on in mathematical physics for 50 years so uh, this model is expected to be accessible. However, as you will see, uh, we don't have, uh, uh, even it should be simpler, it's still hard enough that we don't have full result yet. So let me formulate some part of our result for general random band matrices in dimensional one. So that is for any kind of, not any kind of distribution, but quite general distribution, say like that. So first, by the uh, technique that comes from the uh, random Schrodinger operator, it was proved uh, from the localization side, it was proved that localization length is smaller than W to the eight. That means that if the matrix, so if W is smaller than N to the one over eight, it was proved that it has localization and Poisson statistics. Recently, it was improved to W, not recently, it was five years ago already, but it was improved for W to the seven. But anyway, remember that target L is W squared. So it's still far from the optimal from this side. From the random matrix point of view and so the localization side, it was a series of results that trying to apply this technique uh, coming from Erdoshiao and Taohu uh, papers, uh, you see that it was improved, a bit improved each time, but the last one says that if W bigger than N to the three quarter, then we have universality and uh, local and delocalization. So once again, the target power is one half here. So, uh, that is about dimensional equal to one. In a higher dimension, there is a very recent result of again uh, uh, Yao Yin and Fan that it was appeared in archive, I think, for two weeks ago, something like that. That for dimensional bigger than eight, uh, most part of eigenvectors are delocalized, say like that. Uh, so gen generally. Uh, that is a typical for this kind of models that high dimensional are simpler um, and 
typically, so the hardest thing is d equal two. The next one is typically d equal three, and typically dimensional four and higher are simpler than that. Uh, but once again, in this talk, I'm mainly going to speak about d equal one, so we don't need to care much about high dimensions. So there is another technique that comes from the physical paper that allows to work with such kind of problem that is based on what is called supersymmetry technique. So that is a technique that allows you to write integral representation for the main spectral characteristics, such as density of state, correlation function, elements of resolvent, and many other things like that, as certain integrals that has not only commuting, so usual variables complex, but also some anti-commuting variables. So as a technique based on the fact, so if you have a determinant of some matrix, determinant inverse, everybody knows that it's easy to write it. You can write it as a Gaussian integral of the quadratic exponent of quadratic form of this matrix. This technique tells you that uh, if you have determinant without inverse, you also can write it as some integral, but this quadratic form should be on anti-commuting variables. Combining Gaussian, usual Gaussian representation of the determinant inverse and this Grassmann representation with anti-commuting variables of usual determinant, you can get the spectral characteristic of uh, what you want to obtain as some certain integral. You will see that they are really very much related to statistical mechanics models and uh, after that so that is typically not hard to do uh, so it still have some problems but that is typically just um, uh, five to ten pages of computation and you will be done the main problem comes after that okay now you get this integral this integral is uh, uh, not the usual in complex integral it is it has also anti-commuting variables. The real mathematical challenge comes from the fact that uh, uh, it is hard to analyze it. And so you, the main effort is how to analyze it rigorously. So in the context of random band matrices, this uh, question was elaborated by physicists, started from the effect of and then in particular by the work of Fyodor of Mirren, and in particular it gave the conjecture for d equal one with this square transition in order of w for the square root of n. So, but once again, the main problem, how to do it rigorously. So, as I told you, the method based on representation of the determinant. So, let's think about uh, generalized correlation function, which is just expectation of the ratio of the determinant. So, H is a matrix you are interested in. In our case, it is a random band matrices, and average means the average on its measure. Uh, so we consider a generalized correlation function of order one that just ratio of two determinant, and correlation second correlation function is just ratio of two determinant divided by two determinant. And uh, if you want the link to the spectral correlation, then you can just, for example, first a ratio of two determinant, you can just differentiate it and see that you get the STLTS transform of uh, usual normalized counting measure. So if you know the STLTS transform, you can uh, by uh, CTS transform or get information about the measure. So indeed, if you know the behavior of R1, you can say something about density. Similarly, if you know the behavior of R2, you can say something about second correlation function in particular you can compute the limits you want to to see this determinant of sine kernel structure so what we will be interested in we take this z of energy inside the bulk of the spectrum so minus two two since that density is a semicircle uh, we uh, have some perturbation of this energy of order one over n, and we are interested in the limit again, and we should get that that is a sine kernel. So another spectral characteristic, sorry, I probably have to, uh, spectral characteristic that uh, we will be interested in is correlation function of characteristic polynomial. So you don't consider the ratio, you just consider the average of a product. So these spectral characteristics are also interested in the many 
questions, her critic polynomial of random address is connected with in some mysterious way with even zeta function and many other stuff like that. But in this situation, uh, the main feature of this is that if you apply the technique of uh, Characteristic uh, of uh, super uh, um, symmetry to this kind of spectral statistics, then the integral that you will get after all your computation will be usual complex integral. So it does not have any anti commuting variables in, at the end. It you have it when you derive the formula, but you, it does not have anything at the end. That is why, for the supersymmetry point of view, that's the simplest characteristic you can consider. And the more important thing that it's not only the simplest, but it's also give you the full picture. So it is expected, and now it is a theorem, that it also has transition on the order of square root of n, w of order square root of n. So that's why they are so good. So now let's look how this kind of um, uh, formulas looks like. So uh, we we look mainly on characteristic polynomial because once again that is the simplest model so here there is two formulas the first one is how you can what will be the formula if you get just two determinants of GE matrix and take the average yes so with you take oops that is not what i want to get yeah, so you get this characteristic for with h equal to GE. Then the integral that you will get is very simple. This x is just two by two Kermitian matrix, so you have just four real variables, and that is this n is the size of the matrix. So you see that is a standard complex integral that can be easily analyzed. It has just four real variables, so it can be easily analyzed but, uh, by, for example, steepest descent or whatever method you prefer. You have a big parameter and exponent, so everything is quite simple here. And the next formula is similar expression, but for random band case. So we consider, once again, random band matrices. Matrix J is JJK is a covariance of JK elements. And then what we get will be the following formula. So you take inverse of matrix of covariances, take JK element and has this kind of thing. So you see from this formula that if you put all XJ equal to XK in this form, so all this XJ, XK are again two by two Hermitian matrices. Lambda is just lambda one, lambda two, that is points that you are interested in. So if you put all xj equal to each other, you will get the formula for GUE case. That's easy to get. So somehow, starting from this formula, it is easy to see what actually you need to prove. You need to prove that to this integral, the main fact is given by the points where all xj are the same as if you're familiar with statistical mechanics, that means that your spins are ordered. Classical sync again for statistical mechanics problem. That is what you need to care. So what will be the difference if instead of correlation function of characteristic polynomial, you have a usual correlation function, say first correlation function for density or second correlation function or something else. The formula will be almost the same, except that now this XJ will be not just two by two matrices, Hermitian matrices, but they be what is called super matrices. So they will contain Grassmann variables inside. That is, so for example, for first correlation function, so if you're interested in the density, you will get two real variables and two Grassmann variables. And if you're interested in a second correlation function, it will be four by four matrix. AJ and BJ are complex. AJ Hermitian, BJ is hyperbolic, but anyway, it will be usual matrix. And this rho J bar and tau J bar are two by two matrices of Grassmann variables. So it has one of such matrix has eight anti-commuting variables. And for band case, the number of this XJ is M. So you have so once again, for GUE case, if we return to characteristic polynomial, for GUE case, we have just four real variables in the integral. For band case, we here have, have four n real variables that we need to work with. And if you consider the correlation function 
usual correlation function, then it will be not only that you have this n matrix, but each of these matrix will be super matrix, which includes anti-commuting variables. Um, so now uh, you see that problem general analysis of such kind of questions, so probably I have to start that this formula is true whatever J is. The only thing that you need to get this formula is that distribution is Gaussian. So this, this is what you need, but uh, J can be of any form. So it doesn't matter if the gain it's a zero or whatever, you, for any J you can get this. And moreover, this formula will be okay for any dimension. So it's don't care about you deal with dimension one. This cannot be obtained in any dimensions. But analysis of this formula will be much simpler if you work with a specific structure of random band matrices. So in this talk, we consider two main things. The first one is random band matrices with a specific covariance. So we take J of this form. You can see that if I and J are distance between I and J and bigger than W, then you have exponential decay. Uh, and uh, the, another model that we want to consider is what is called Wegener orbital model, and that is a model of interest by itself. So it is a instead of considering just a strip, we consider the block matrices. Each block's A J B J is W times W matrix. So the diagonal blocks are G E W times W matrices, and B one are Gaussian uh, matrices without symmetry. So it is a Geneva matrices. Yes. And only three diagonals of this block are non-zero, all other elements are zero. So you can see that indeed non-zero elements again will be in a strip of size of order W. That is why it is also can be considered as a band matrices. We also specify the covariance of these matrices. So in B, the covariance will be one minus two alpha. And for A, it will be, uh, no, the opposite on A, it will be 1 minus 2 alpha divided by W, and on B, it will be alpha divided by W. Uh, that comes from the, um, again, including there some Laplacian structure somehow like that. Um, again, that comes from some physical reason why indeed this model are interested and that is not so important here so in principle you can consider other uh, covariances here the only important thing is that you need the three diagonal structure that you have here so why it is important that is important because of That is important because as you saw in this formula, we have J inverse. So for example, if you take this J of this form, the J inverse will be three diagonal matrix. So for both model, for second model, you need to proceed a little bit different way. But anyway, the main idea that for both model, these formulas that you have here can, becomes nearest neighbor model, which means that this interaction xj, xk will be only for j and j minus one. And that makes this model much more accessible for the analysis. So for example, for the specific covariance that we discuss, the integral becomes as follows. So you have this xj minus xj minus one square that is interaction, and that is something that factorizes in j. So again, if you speak from the statistical mechanics point of view, we have a nearest neighbor interaction, and that is external magnetic field, whatever uh, you. So once again, the classical picture of statistical mechanics model with certain uh, spins, say like that. Um, so why it is important for us? Because we want to apply what's called the transfer matrix approach for this kind of model. And then typically means that you need to have interaction J, J minus one, J minus one, J minus two. And so it should be the chain. So um, uh, once again, 
let me say probably a few words. So what are the rigorous supersymmetric results for Gaussian random bare matrices of a certain type, mainly of that type that I discussed previously? So for characteristic polynomials, we can say now everything. So we know that transition happens at square root of n. We know that for w bigger than square root, we have a Gaussian behavior. For smaller, we have another behavior. And we even know what happens on the transition point. So we know almost everything. And also, we know this for real symmetric case. For more complicated characteristic, which are uh, uh, usual correlation function. Uh, we can prove, uh, uh, so again, it was a number of results that uh, people proved. So first, uh, it was proved that we can um, obtain universality for W of order n. So for example, if Wn divided by some k were k is fixed, this result was uh, improved to the localization for w bigger than n to the 6 over 7. Uh, what is important here is two things. That first of all, pre at that moment, the result that was able to get with 6 over 7 was only for most eigenvectors, not for the all eigenvectors, so it was a weaker form of the localization. And secondary, this result shows that uh, shows that you can do it not only on for Gaussian case, but also for sub-Gaussian by this technique. What does it mean? So generally it works like that. You do something for Gaussian case, as a, and then you apply what is called green function comparison strategy to, uh, with, you need some more bounds on the resolvent elements for that, but typically you can obtain this bounds by this technique. And so if you can prove that for Gaussian, you can by random, some standard now random matrix technique, uh, expand this result for more general distribution, but with a for Gaussian moments and sub-Gaussian tails. So not for any distribution, but for more general class. So once again, you see that Gaussian is not such a big restriction. The more serious restriction is this specific form. It can be released a bit, but not too much because of the technique that was applied there. So, uh, and after that, more recently, uh, we were able to first proof that for second correlation function we have a uh, universality first in sigma model approximation which is simplified version that physicists prefer to work with uh, but again you need to do it rigorously and the last result is that second correlation so let me probably for so what's going on with arrows I have no idea. Uh, yeah, so that is a theorem. So if you take this Gaussian block band matrices, and uh, then the result states that if only, so in a block matrices, the size of the matrix is W times the number of blocks. So the transition of should happen when the W is the same as the number of blocks in a row. Yes, so the theorem tells you that if W is bigger than number of blocks in a row, then indeed you have the determinant of sine kernel. So you only need the W is bigger than number of blocks times log to the fifth of this number of blocks. So we expect that the method should also work for localization side, but it becomes more complicated in this case, which is somehow surprising because typically localized regime should be simpler than delocalized. But uh, in this case, uh, by this technique, we have a different experience. Anyway, we still think that it should probably work, but for delocalized regime, you, we can, by this technique, with this specific form and with the Gaussian element, certainly, but we can go up to the optimal regime W of order n. Uh, and once again, probably it should, there is no uh, any uh, principal restriction why this method should not work for localized regime. It should work there, the only thing that it's uh, technically can be more complicated. And at this moment, we are not able to perform this in a full rigorous way. But there is no any specific restriction why that should not work here. 
Okay. So now let me speak a little bit about characteristic polynomial because if you want to speak a bit about the proof, then more simple thing to discuss characteristic polynomial as the simplest model. So first of all, let me say that characteristic polynomial of different kind of random matrices and even this specific equation of local behavior was studied for many ensembles. For example, for Hermitian case, uh, it was known that if you consider not just two characteristic polynomials, but two K of them, then the limiting behavior will be like this formula. Here you have the determinant of sine kernel divided by two van der Mond determinants. So this delta here is a van der Mond determinant of psi. And for real symmetric case, you have a similar picture, but you have a Pfaffian of different kernel. So it was done by Brizan Hikami for just two determinants and by Bardin and Strachow for K determinant. And this formula also was proved for the general case for Wigner matrices um, and many, uh, and for sample covariance matrices. The only difference that for Wigner matrices, you have the same structure with the determinant, but this CN will depend on the fourth cumulant of the distribution. So you can do it for more or less any distribution if only average of the determinant is uh, defined, but you need uh, to get the same behavior for Gaussian, you need for Gaussian moments, but even without for Gaussian moment, you just have multiplication by constants that depends on force cumulant. So it's not like it's completely different behavior, just multiplication by some constant. So, uh, what we have for random band matrices and again that is for Hermitian case. So if F2 is a product of two determinant and you normalize it properly, then in the limit as size of the matrix goes to infinity, you have the following picture. You have this sine kernel if W bigger than n to the one half plus some setter. If W is smaller than square root of n divided by log n, then you get just one. And in between, you have the following behavior, which can be described as follows. So C star is a constant if you divide n by W square, it's some constant, yes. This color product and this Laplacian with index U is a Laplacian on two-dimensional sphere and color product on two-dimensional sphere. Yes, so this new, so, um, you will see that that actually uh, the behavior of this depends on uh, behavior on U2 group if you consider the unitary two by two matrix as a vector on a sphere by the standard parameterization then you get this uh, sc scalar product in two-dimensional sphere of a on two-dimensional sphere and this new corresponds to operator of multiplication one one minus two x, where x is of diagonal elements of a two by two unitary matrix. So you can see that if C star is big, then you can neglect this term with multiplication operator, and that gives you one. So you will be in this case. If C star is goes to zero, then you can neglect the Laplacian and the integral of this multi exponent of multiplication operator. It's easy to see if you sign kernel. So indeed, this behavior will glue together these two regimes. And that is generally not what people expect in this for the case of second correlation function. For the second correlation function, people expect to have some kind of fractal behavior there, but that model with characteristic polynomial is not rich enough to see this uh, in, Can I in ask between. A, yeah. So this uh, this uh, this thing that you get when n is equal to c star w squared. So, so you you explained us the two limiting regimes, but for for a fixed C star, can you write this as some explicit uh, integral, or is it th th there is no way to to simplify it for, well to to get something more explicit than than what you wrote? Uh, yeah. So in principle, you can you can do 
try to write something more explicit. For example, try to obtain the behavior of this as psi go to infinity or something like that. But there is no good formula that you can apply to. So it's additional work that you need to perform. And that is not simple. So I don't have simple way how to see this with uh, this. Uh, even be decay with psi going to infinity is not so easy to get from this expression, unfortunately. Um, so, uh, but once again, here we can do almost everything, and uh, we also can do it for orthogonal case by the same method. You will get different kernel here, but all other stuff will be the same. You still will be have the transition and square root of w, and uh, get just different kernel and different Laplacian here. All other things will be the same. So. Uh, let's discuss some heuristic of this formula, why we should get something like that. Again, that somehow gives you connection with statistical mechanics picture. So consider this case with J of this strange form such that J inverse is three diagonal matrix. Then you get this formula. Once again, all this XJ are two by two Hermitian matrices. So we can come to the polar coordinates. So we can diagonalize XJ by unitary two by two matrix. And uh, you get two real eigenvalues and this unitary two by two matrix on, you will come to this integral. So what you will get, imagine now that, uh, certainly you probably can see that you have some, uh, part that is factorized and xj. So you can compute the set of points for eigenvalues. And uh, if now you do what is physicist called going to the sigma model approximation. So you uh, just put eigenvalues of all xj equal to the set of point value. So certainly if you not want to do it rigorously, you need to prove that you can do this. But assume that you just do it. So you make simplified model. Yes, then you can, these set of points are somehow plus minus one time constant. So instead of xj, you will get matrix uj star l uj, where this l is just uh, one minus one on the diagonal matrix. And uh, you can easily uh, by parameterize the unitary group by sine and cosine. As usual, you can just uh, consider this vector as a vector on the usual two-dimensional sphere. Then, integral representation that you get will be the following. This is, uh, W is the width of the band. This rho, that lambda zero is E, uh, so that is energy that you're considering uh, about uh, which you're considering the local behavior. So that is just semicircle density. So you get big parameter times scalar product of two vectors on two-dimensional sphere plus some external field where this sigma three is some fixed vector. And so the problem that you will see right now will be the following. Having this model, <coughs> if this big parameter is bigger than size of the system, you expect that all vector will be on the same main contribution given by the point where all vector are uh, pointed in the same direction. And then this integral, this term will disappear. And the integral will become just integral on the one sphere, which gives you the sine kernel. So that is how you can see why this sine kernel actually will be here. And if W square is smaller than N, then you cannot say like that. And somehow your vectors can be in any direction. And then this, this just, it will be um, the expectation of all this kind of thing will just give you one instead of the same curve. So that is somehow statistical mechanics picture, which comes from the classical Heisenberg model, because you know, so if you're familiar with this kind of thing, you certainly know that Heisenberg model is indeed, is exactly the model when your spins are the vector on two dimensional sphere. So you see that this model is really closely related to the Heisenberg model. And in particular for D equal one, you can see why the answer it should be like you have. 
And secondary, it gives you the idea why it is so hard for d equal 2 and d equal 3, because even this simplified version of Heisenberg model does not know uh, for d equal 2 and d equal 3. So similar question for higher dimension, it's, it's not known even for the simplified version and especially for non-simplified. That is why it is hard to do things. But for d equal 1, that question for Heisenberg model is not so hard. So you can uh, try to do it without sigma model approximation and that is mainly what we perform with the transfer matrix approach. So let me say a few words about transfer matrix approach and how it works. So the idea of this kind of approach that if you have this kind of chain model where interaction is between x1, x2, x2, x3 and so, as we have here, so let's read. Yes, we have only nearest neighbor interaction. Then you can write instead of your integral representation, you can write integral operator to the n power applied to some specific vectors. And so instead of studying the integral, you can study this operator, which is called the transfer operator. So the idea is that if you have this power, you can write it if you can diagonalize your transfer operator, then you can write it uh, in this form. And so uh, where lambda j's are eigenvectors, eigenvalues of k. And uh, so you can easily see uh, what should be the difference. So typically in all kinds of such problems, which appears here with the random band matrices, the first eigenvalues will be one or close to one. So first uh, term zero eigenvalue, j equals zero, always give you one. Uh, now the question is what you can say about the next eigenvalue. So if you can prove that the next eigenvalue is one of minus c over w square, then you can easily see why the transition happens when n becomes bigger or smaller than w square. Because if you consider the nth power of this guy, if n is bigger than w square, then you can neglect all other terms, yes. But if n is smaller than w squared, that is not the case. And so you have more terms that you need to count. So once again, from here, you can easily see if you can prove that the gap between two eigenvalues is of order w squared, you can immediately see the transition. Or only everything just sit on lambda zero, or you need to count many terms, and that gives you certainly different answer. That is idea of this approach. So once again, instead of considering this whole integral, you consider just transfer operator. So how this operator looks like? It's uh, probably a little bit nasty to think about this function, but you don't need to care much about the function. It looks like some function times this w square of tr different trace square times again some function and function have some specific form Yes, uh, so what is important? So once again, that is an uh, operator for characteristic polynomials. If you have real correlation function, you need to work, uh, you also have transfer operator, but this X and Y again will be just some super matrices. So um, what is the problems with this approach in general? So the problems are the following. So the first problem, appear directly with the characteristic polynomial already. The main point of this transfer operator is that it's not self-adjoint and it's essentially not self-adjoint. So this set of points of this function f are complex and so quadratic part you have complex stuff that you cannot, so in principle you can try to rotate something but that is in the point it's not self-adjoint and things that depends on xi is perturbation on one over n. And uh, again, the point that if you have not self-adjoint perturbation, uh, not self-adjoint operators, then the perturbation theory is much more delicate things that you have just a self-adjoint operator. So that is the first point. The second point that the main contribution will come from this point, as we discuss when, uh, xj is just uj star 
1 minus 1 uj, where uj is two by two matrix. So it's not like you have just one set of points, you have a set of manifold and you need to work on this set of manifold with some continuous symmetry and stuff like that. This requires to work with uh, spherical harmonics. That is not as bad for this case, but uh, for more serious correlation function, you also need to work uh, on with uh, uh, so it will be not only the unitary group, it also will be hyperbolic groups that you need to deal with. And so you need to work with the harmonics there and hyperbolic group is non-compact. So that is another thing that on a compact group, operators are, all operators are compact and discrete. And so you can, uh, your spectrum is discrete and you can work uh, that is not so hard to work with, but on a non-compact manifold, the operators are more delicate thing and you need to work more accurately there. So once again, it's not for characteristic polynomials, but for general case with second correlation function, that becomes a problem. And the most important problem here is the following. So this operator that I showed you, uh, shown you is um, uh, for characteristic polynomials. If you're interested in state density, as I told, xj will be two by two matrix with two real two Grassmann variables. That means that transfer operator will be not just like this operator, but it will be four by four matrix. Each element of this is operator of this kind. So if xj has M Grassmann, then the matrix will be two to the M power. So for second correlation function, the matrix X has eight Grassmann. So your matrix will be 256 times 256 matrix. Each element of this matrix is some complicated L2 operators that depends on W of this kind. That is the main structure problem of that. Certainly you can use some kind of symmetry and so you not, don't really need this 256. It's enough to have 70 by 70 metrics, but still 70 by 70 is too big for the good analysis. And that is why we performed it actually step by step uh, to work with. So uh, the uh, idea was uh, first deal with without Grassmann with first two problems and deals with the Grassmann's, uh, just two Grassmann's and so four by four matrix. Then we consider it sigma model approximation, which is uh, 16 by 16 matrix because it has four Grassmann for each side. And actually on a sigma model approximation, that is similar to what I did with this Heisenberg model, just put in uh, eigenve eigenvectors, uh, eigenvalues equal to the, their set of point values. Then you can see actually uh, that important thing is just six by six matrix. And you can prove that instead of this 256 times 256 matrix, you just need to consider six by six matrix. Uh, which is certainly much better than this one. Uh, and after that, you, so somehow the crucial step here was to work with the sigma model approximation regress. And after that, it was possible to do it also for big metrics with the, uh, which comes from the second correlation function. So let me probably say a few words. So uh, what is the idea, how we did all this stuff? So the, again, the work is highly technical, I have to confess. So it is really hard to explain in a few words what, what's going on, but the idea is quite simple. So what, what we did, we, as I discussed, we have this power of transfer operator. So instead of consider power, we consider it as a contour integral of the resolvent on transfer operator, where the contour consists all eigenvalues of your transfer operators. Then the idea that it is hard to analyze this KXC and its resolvent. So instead of doing this, we're trying to find something simpler operator such that this expression with the resolvent is close to each other. That is the idea. So you somehow 
make a series of simplification of your transfer operator up to the operators that you are able to analyze. Somehow that is the idea. So what's generally going on? So as I told, the top eigenvalues of transfer operator, no matter with perturbation of no or not, is of order one. So uh, the all kind of eigenvalues you can can be in a unit in a circle with a radius one plus one over n, something like that. Yes, then um, you do the following thing. So if uh, the number of eigenvalues is quite big, so if you already uh, can have gap more between one and this eigenvalue of order log square, divide by n, then you don't need to care about this eigenvalue. So because n's power of them are small. Yes, yeah, so if you take this one minus log square n of n to the power n, then it is it will be exponentially small, so you don't care about that. So first of all, you get rid of all eigenvalues that are too small to care about. And after that, you need to uh, perform analysis. So first, you prove that all the set of points actually give the uh, um, impact to your operator. So first, you restrict your operator to the neighborhood of the set of points. There is uh, uh, two type of set of points. There is two set of points and set of manifold. Set of manifold, that is what gives you the main impact, but you need to deal with set of points as well, because that is what you have. After that, you somehow diagonalize your matrix, and what you do in you tell them that you can uh, consider separately the operator on eigenvalues and operator on the unitary group. And operator on eigenvalues, it's uh, more simple because the gap uh, between top eigenvalue and the second eigenvalue is of order one over W here. So if only N is bigger than W that we expect because W is the width of the band and N is the size, so W is always smaller than N. You can neglect somehow this kind of... so. The, somehow, the next step is the idea that you indeed can rigorously go to the sigma model approximation. That is the next step. And after that, after you will be able to do so, you need to deal only with operator on a unitary group. And to work with this, you can just uh, uh, consider uh, perturbation. So what is the good thing that if you already restricted only on operator on unitary group, then the main operator without perturbation is self-adjoint now. And so you can apply perturbation theory well. Uh, so this operator is possible to analyze and uh, for remaining operator that you need, it's really quite simple. So that will be the operator, main operator without perturbations that you need to deal with. So U1, U2 are unitary two by two matrix, and that is kernel of this operator that you need to work with. But this operator, you know its eigenfunction because they are the same as for Laplacian because it's a different operator that comes from the... Um, uh, so any kind uh, of uh, difference operator has the same uh, on uh, on the two-dimensional sphere has the same uh, uh, eigen eigenvalues or eigen function as the usual Laplacian, and uh, so you can analyze it and write uh, asymptotic relation for its eigenvalues, and you indeed will see that the gap between first one and the next one will be of order double the square. After that, you apply perturbation. So you have gap between two eigen, eigenvalues of the main operators of order W square, and your perturbation is one over M. So you see that if perturbation is smaller than this gap, then it gives you nothing. If perturbation is bigger than gap, then you certainly need to work with, and that uh, changes the behavior of uh, what you have. That is more or less the idea. So. Uh, Probably I have to stop here. So once again, the main idea is that 
using this transfer matrix approach, you can perform your set of point analysis somehow step by step and come in finally to the operator that is self-adjoined and that is much easier to analyze. That is somehow the idea. So, okay, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much uh, for your talk. So. Do you have questions or comments? Um, so maybe I have a, a question to start with. Um, so you said so you are able to to have uh, the transition um, of uh, the order when uh, that occurs at uh, order square root of n, and mm -hmm. so can you obtain results uh, on um, the behavior of the, the eigenvalues uh, uh, which are of this order because they interpolate between Poisson and uh, GUI. So do you, do you have some result uh, on on that like? Uh, uh, so do, do you mean something like a point process or something like that? Or yeah, like, mean? I don't know. There is so something that shows that indeed they, are, they, are, they make a transition between the two, uh, maybe uh, about two point uh, correlation so, or anything. Uh, no, so mainly what we was interested in is uh, what is called the gap universality so the yeah. order how they repel that we can get yes oh okay that's really nice yeah but for if you speak about point processes that we can't yeah so mm -hmm. if you if you need the like convergence of point process one point process to another one that probably we can't get but the gap universality yes it is possible okay so some statistics in general yeah yeah yes, somehow like that yes but uh, um so for so um probably i have to be uh, uh more clear that we can get it so we, we we did not write that and did not actually but we in principle we can get that the point that you need not only second we, we proved it for second correlation function you need a higher order correlation function to do it so it is possible generally to do so uh, but uh, it will be even harder than it was for second correlation function, but even with the second correlation function, it was a pain, like they say, like that. So yeah. the for characteristic polynomial, it's really nice uh, thing yeah. when you can clearly see what's going on, and that kind of it's yeah. it's it is it's still technical, but it's nice for second order correlation function. It is technical and probably not nice. <laughs> this is, yeah, I see. <laughs> Thank you. Despite the same idea. So other questions? I have one question. What you discussed was about um, what happens uh, microscopically in the bulk of the spectrum. Uh, and if you consider the edge of the spectrum, uh, the, the transition happens at the same point and... No, 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 no. The, the thing that for the edge of the spectrum, that is typically a much easier question because you can apply the moment method here. And for, in particular for band matrices, it was applied in 2009, I think, by Sasha Sodin. And the transition happens, as far as I remember, to n to the 4 over 5. Uh, he also did it for some specific distribution, but anyway, for the edge, it was somehow known for a long period of time. That is the same with the Wigner matrices. For the edge, it was known for a late 19th, but with the bulk, it was done only in 2010. So it's kind of okay. a different story here. So you can apply it for the edge by this technique as well, but since it's already done, it's not, not reasonable to do so yet. Okay. Other questions? Okay, it seems uh, we have no other questions. So thank you very much for your very nice talk. Thank you.